Hello and welcome to lecture 4 of Bioinformatics for Schoolers course. In this lecture, we will understand that what is a gene and how does the gene function. So, let's get started. Now, if I ask you that what is it that you see on your screen, then I'm sure you would say that it's a necklace. But now, if I ask you that what it is made of, then it is very evident that it is made up of many, many beads. Okay, so we can say that a bead is a building block of a necklace. Similarly, a nucleotide is a building block of our DNA. If I further uh, see its component, a nucleotide is made up of sugar and phosphate and a base. Now, I don't intend to scare you, but uh, this is how the actual structure of a nucleotide looks like. You can see the ring structure of the sugar and the phosphate group attached to it and also you can observe the ring structure of the base and uh, so basically this is an example of a base known as adenine now many such nucleotides link together to form a polynucleotide chain so a chain has two ends a five prime end and a three prime end so the end at which uh, the 5 prime phosphate group is hanging is known as a 5 prime end and the end at which uh, the 3 prime hydroxyl group is hanging uh, oh group is hanging is known as a 3 prime end so now i don't uh, i don't expect you to remember all the details but just remember that a polynucleotide chain contains a 5 prime end as well as a 3 prime end now, our DNA is made up of two such polynucleotide chains uh, in which the backbone is made up of sugar and phosphate and the bases are projected inside. Uh, now, these two chains have anti-parallel uh, directionality. That means one chain runs from 3' prime to 5', prime, whereas the other chain runs from three prime, uh, the 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And if you see closely, then you will see that there are three bond lines between G and C, whereas two bond lines between T and A. Now, you would already know that G always pairs with C and T always pairs with A. But uh, the bond between GC is stronger than the bond between T and A. So, that was a representative image of DNA. But in reality, DNA is a double helical structure in which both the strands wound over each other. Okay, so this is also known as the Watson and Crick model of DNA. Uh, now, in genetics, we often use the term DNA and gene interchangeably because both of these are the uh, basic units of heredity. But in reality, these two things are different. Okay, Just to put in context, we, the humans, are made up of trillions of cells and each cell contains a nucleus and a cytoplasm. So, nucleus is the uh, location where our genetic material is housed. Okay, so the nucleus contains uh, around 23 pairs of chromosomes and the chromosomes are further made up of uh, units known as nucleosome. Now, a nucleosome is nothing but a protein known as histone around which our DNA is tightly wrapped. Now, a gene is the segment of DNA that uh, determines a certain trait, uh, trait. And how does it do so? It does so by making a protein, by expressing itself, or sometimes it only makes a RNA molecule. Now, so these are the examples of different traits that are determined by genes, such as dimples on the cheeks, widow's peaks, freckles, hitchhiker's thumb, uh, tongue rolling, and attached or free ear loops. Now, we have observed that many of our traits, such as hair color, eye color, or height, uh, are similar to one of the parent, or some other traits are similar to the other parent. And in some cases, uh, uh, we have traits that are uh, similar to our grandparents. So, traits are nothing, but uh, they are expressed by the genes that are uh, passed on from our ancestors and make us who we are. Now, the question arises that how do we uh, inherit genes or DNA from our parents or even grandparents? So, the answer lies in the self-replicating nature of, a, of our DNA. A single DNA molecule can make its own uh, copies and that's how we get uh, uh, DNA from our parents. So initially, the old DNA strands separate from each other and the new DNA strands are formed based on the information uh, of the old DNA strands. Now, according to base pairing rule, we know that wherever there is a uh, there is a, a on the old DNA strand, on the new DNA strand, there will be a T. Similarly, wherever there is a C uh, on old DNA strand, on new DNA strand, there will be a G. So basically, the old DNA strand acts as a template, okay, or the major strands on, uh, on which the new DNA strands form their copies. So in the end when uh, when you get two dna molecules then 
part of the uh, part of the dna molecule will be from the old parental dna and part of the dna molecule will be newly synthesized so this mode of replication is known as semi conservative mode of dna replication because the uh, parental dna is partially conserved now if we go deeper into the process of dna replication then we understand that there are certain regions in the dna uh, on which replication actually starts okay so dna is a very long uh, molecule it contains 3.3 billion base pairs uh, replication for replication you understand that the strands have to be separated so all together uh, the whole dna did not uh, does not unwind okay so basically there are certain regions which starts unwinding at first so these regions are generally at rich regions because now you know that the bond uh, between at is weaker so these can these regions uh, containing at rich sequences can actually open faster so initially there are certain set of proteins that are known as uh, initiator proteins that come and bind to the dna and help in the winding of this uh, sorry unwinding of the dna uh, after that there is a protein known as heli, uh, helicases and the major function of the helicases is to actually go and sit on the dna and make it uh, in the unwound stage now after the dna is unwound there is a uh, there is a protein known as uh, dna primase it will come and bind to the helicase and will start synthesizing short stretch of nucleotides okay it uh, it actually forms the base on which the uh, new dna chains can start forming once the primase has synthesized a uh, small stretch of nucleotides that is known as primer then another protein known as dna polymerase comes uh, sits on it and start extending those primers to form the new molecules new dna stretches okay so the uh, synthesis takes place in the opposite direction and finally the uh, the termination happens the process stops and we get two dna molecules out of one so the red strands that you see are actually the newly synthesized strands and the orange strands were the initial parental strands okay so this is how replication takes place but if we talk about the speed of replication uh, then in bacteria it is about 1000 nucleotides per second but in humans it is 50 nucleotides per second now considering the length of dna in humans you have 3.3 billion nucleotides so at this speed you would at least take a month to complete the replication but uh, this does not happen okay why because in humans we have multiple uh, replications of origin so the replication can actually starts at multiple points at once and uh, the entire process takes about only only one hour to get completed yeah. one important point to discuss in the process of dna replication is that dna polymerase can synthesize the strand uh, the dna strand comfortably only in one direction that is from 5 prime to 3 prime whereas for the opposite strand it uh, it first synthesizes dna in the short fragments which are then later joined to form the complete dna strand these uh, short fragments are known as okazaki fragments named after the scientist who discovered them let's try to understand uh, this process by an example uh, for instance you want to uh, row a boat in a stream of water now when you are going in the direction of the stream you would be able to cover larger distances at once whereas if you are rowing the boat in the opposite uh, direction of the stream then you would face the water current and you would be only able to cover shorter distances at one time uh, that's how dna polymerase uh, similarly can continuously synthesize the strand only in the one direction whereas for the other direction the synthesis is discontinuous now having understood the process of replication our main aim to understand how a gene uh, expresses so the principle underlying this phenomena is known as central dogma given by francis crick and dogma is uh, something is a, is a set of beliefs or a belief system that people uh, accept without questioning so it states that that the information flows only in one direction for example dna can synthesize dna through replication then it can trans uh, transcribe into mrna and further the rna can be translated into protein and it is the protein which does all the work now in bacteria 
This process is very straightforward and simple. For example, DNA transcription happens, RNA forms, then translation happens, and proteins form. But in case of eukaryotes, such as humans, uh, there is a very, uh, very much compartmentalization involved. That is, our DNA stays in the nucleus, and for expressing a protein, it, it will not come out in the cytoplasm and do the function. Instead, First, DNA is transcribed into RNA within the nucleus and then there are some RNA processing happens that also happens within the nucleus and then RNA goes out into the cytoplasm and makes the protein. Now, similar to DNA, RNA is also made up of nucleotides which in turn are made up of sugar, phosphate and base. Now, these nucleotides are linked together in a polynucleotide chain having 5' prime to 3' prime directionality. So, the building blocks of DNA and RNA is same, that is nucleotide, but they are uh, really very different. So, if you look closely, DNA is made up of four bases, that is A, C, T and G, whereas RNA is made up of A, C, U and G. So, U is uh, present in place of T. Also, the sugar that is present in the DNA is known, is known as deoxyribose sugar and that's why the name of DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. Whereas in case of RNA, ribose sugar is present and that's why it, got it, uh, it, it has got his na uh, its name which is ribonucleic acid. If you look at the strands, DNA is a double-stranded molecule which provides uh, its stability, whereas RNA is a single-stranded molecule and that's why it is very unstable as compared to DNA. And structure-wise, DNA is a double helical structure in which two strands are wounded over each other, whereas in case of RNA, the single strand can form base pairing between itself and can form different sorts of structure, uh, like you see dancing uh, kind of structure uh, here. And if you look closely, you would see that within itself, it has made a uh, base pairing such as G is bonded with C, uh, A is bonded with U and so on. Now, there are certain regions in the DNA that mark uh, the beginning and the end of the transcription. Uh, promoter it marks actually the beginning of the transcription and act as a go signal, whereas terminator act as a stop signal for the transcription and the gene needs to be transcribed or expressed lies in the middle. So, uh, and unlike DNA, RNA is a single stranded molecule. So, only one strand of DNA acts as a template to make RNA. And uh, so, strand 3 prime to 5 prime actually acts as a template strand, the strand that you see here on top. Further, similar to DNA replication for transcription also, DNA uh, strands have to unwind and then one of the strand acts as a template to form RNA through the process of transcription. You know that the language of DNA and RNA is similar. How? Because their building blocks are same. So now if I tell you the sequence of the DNA, I'm sure you can now guess uh, the sequence of the RNA strand. Uh, how is it so? It is according to the base pairing rule. You uh, very well know that wherever there is a C on the template strand, uh, G will be synthesized on RNA. Wherever there is a A on template strand, U will come and so on. Now, going deeper into the transcription process, we see that RNA polymerase is a protein that actually synthesizes RNA, but it needs uh, the help of a factor known as sigma factor. So first of all, RNA polymerase and sigma factor binds to the DNA and keep on sliding. So basically, if you remember that the start of transcription is marked by a sequence known as promoter. So the RNA polymerase keeps on sliding until it finds that sequence. So on finding the promoter, it uh, stops and starts opening the DNA. Now, imagine if, if you have a long list of grocery items uh, that you wish to read and that list is lying on the table, then you have two choices to read that list. First, you can keep walking alongside the table and keep reading the list. Or the second choice is that you can pull the list towards yourself and keep reading it. So RNA polymerase takes the second approach. In order to read the DNA to synthesize RNA, it keeps pulling DNA towards itself and keeps reading it. 
But imagine DNA is a very long molecule. Okay, so pulling the DNA molecule and stretching it creates a loss of uh, uh, a lot of stress. So uh, at that time, RNA polymerase keeps pulling it and keeps sitting on the promoter and uh, start synthesizing short RNA molecules. But because the stress is now too much on the DNA, it has to release the stress. So in order to release the stress, it leaves the promoter and then instead keeps walking on the DNA to read it and to synthesize RNA. So it keeps walking up and keep adding the complementary base pairs by looking at the information that is present on the DNA and uh, until it finds a terminator sequence. So uh, basically the terminator, if you remember, is the sequence where the transcription has to stop. So on finding the terminator sequence, the RNA uh, that is made takes the shape of a hairpin, uh, uh, takes the shape of a hairpin and uh, on, on uh, realizing that the RNA is, has now formed a hairpin-like structure, RNA polymerase understands that now the terminator sequence has arrived and now the transcription has to be stopped. So uh, on arriving at this sequence, RNA polymerase stops and releases DNA as well as RNA. And that's how the process of transcription is completed. The new RNA that is transcribed consists of two portions, that is the exon and intron. The exon is the coding sequence that will actually be translated into protein and these exons are intervened by a set of non-coding sequences. So the question arises that what will happen to the non-coding regions? And now RNA has to go out from the nucleus into the cytoplasm to make the protein. So the question is that will it be recognized by the protein machinery? And will it be everlasting? That means will it be protected from degradation? So in order to answer these questions, we first get our RNA ready so that it can be transported successfully out into the cytoplasm and also is successfully translated. So we will put a cap at the 5' prime end of the mRNA in a process known as capping. Now having this tag will ensure that the RNA is now be able to recognize by the uh, protein synthesis machinery. Secondly, uh, in a process of tailing, a series of A nucleotides are added at the 3' prime end of the RNA so that the RNA is now protected from any degradation. Thirdly, in a process of splicing, all the uh, introns are removed and the exons are spliced together. Now this RNA is ready to be able to go out into the cytoplasm and be translated. Coming back to the central dogma, till now we have discussed the process of replication and transcription. Now let's uh, talk about the process of translation by which the protein is made. So first of all, the protein uh, is made up of many, many amino acids. So the building blocks of protein is very dis different from that of DNA and RNA. But the amino acids of the protein also makes a chain like a uh, makes a chain like structure and it has two ends. The end at which uh, which is starting from N is known as N terminal and the end at which the C is present is known as the C terminal. So the amino acids are linked together to form a polypeptide and the polypeptide actually uh, folds itself to perform its function accurately. So these are the example of few of the protein structures. Uh, at first, this is the hemoglobin which gives a red uh, color to the blood and helps in carrying oxygen throughout the body cells. The second protein here is insulin. You would have heard about insulin uh, which di diabetic patients take in the form of injections. So it helps to control the level of glucose in the blood. Uh, thirdly, there is an important protein which is found in the plant systems known as rubisco. So rubisco takes the uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide and helps plants in the, in the process of respiration. So all these proteins shown here folds themselves to perform their functions effectively. In case of simpler organisms such as bacteria, on one RNA, message from different genes can be there. So, the proteins which usually work together can be translated from one single RNA itself. But in case of humans, uh, since they are complex, one RNA can only uh, translate into one type of protein. 
Now, before understanding the process of translation, it is important to recognize that the languages of RNA and protein are different. Okay, the RNA is made up of four nucleotides that is A, C, U and G, whereas the proteins are made up of 20 different amino acids. So, initially it was a challenge uh, to understand that how could RNA be copied into protein. If you think that one nucleotide can code for one amino acid such as A uh, can be copied into aspartic acid and so on, then there could be only four possibilities. That means 16 amino acids will still be left. So it was thought that maybe two nucleotides code for one amino acid, but still if you can make the combinations such as A, C can code for aspartic acid, A, A can code for glutamic acid and so on, there would be only 16 total possibilities. Still, Still four amino acids will be left. So then it was thought that what if three nucleotides can code for one amino acid. Then if you see the possibilities it will be like ACU coding for aspartic acid, uh, CUG coding for glutamic acid and so on. So then it was found that there are 64 such possibilities and there are many more uh, than required because you only need 20, uh, you only need to code only for 20 amino acids. So that's how the genetic code was cracked. It was found that the code is a triplet of three bases and this triplet is known as a codon. One codon code for one amino acid, such as UUU here codes for phenylalanine. There are a total of 64 combinations or 64 codons, out of which only 61 code for amino acids and three codons does not code for anything, but instead they are stop signals. For example, if you see closely in the table, you would see uh, UAA, UAG and UGA uh, in, front of the, uh, in front of these, it is written as stop. So these three codons code for stop signal. Wherever they are there, the uh, translation actually stops. And similarly, there is another uh, codon that is AUG, which performs the dual function. It is the initiator codon, meaning the translation starts from AUG and also it codes for amino acid methionine. Now, this is an example of how an uh, RNA gets translated into the protein. The translation starts from AUG codon, uh, that is methionine, and uh, that's how it uh, goes on to read RNA in the basis, uh, in the set of three bases, and uh, until it reaches the end. So, for translation process, we need an RNA as a template. And because of the language difference in RNA and protein, we also need a translator known as tRNA. So imagine a situation where uh, RNA that has to be translated is sitting inside the cytoplasm and multiple tRNAs are roaming and trying to read the sequence of RNA base by base. So a tRNA would read the codon on mRNA and if it is uh, if it matches with its uh, own sequence such as ACC is complementary to UGG then it stays there and if we see in the codon table UGG codes for tryptophan and see tryptophan is already here attached to the tRNA. That means this is the correct pairing. Likewise, the tRNA keeps bringing the amino acids and checking the codons on mRNA. The third important component of translation is ribosome. A ribosome is considered as a protein factory because it sits on the RNA and provide sites such as E, P and A to make the protein. Um, I used to remember the names of this site as E A P E means ape. So it's up to you how you uh, remember. And the ribosome is composed of two subunits, a larger one and a smaller one. Whenever a new tRNA approaches to ribosome and mRNA complex, it sits on the A site of the uh, ribosome and ribosome then links the third and fourth amino acid as shown here. Further, the upper subunit of the ribosome shifts to make uh, the A site empty so that another tRNA can come and bind to it. Following the shifting in upper subunit, the lower part of the ribosome also shifts by three bases. Like this, A site becomes completely empty. Uh, then again, a new matching tRNA can come and bind to the A site and this process goes on, uh, on making to in order to make the uh, protein chain longer. 
towards the end when ribosome reaches uh, to uag uh, codon that is a stop signal if you remember a release factor binds to the a site and terminates the translation finally the raw materials uh, of translation such as a ribosome trna and uh, mrna they also fall apart so far we have discussed all the three components of central dogma that is replication uh, transcription and translation now going ahead with gene expression it is important to understand that all the genes do not express in equal amounts for example rna for gene a is more in this case and consequently the protein that is made is more as compared to gene b because expression of gene consumes a lot of energy and therefore the cell can decide how much gene to express when to express and which gene should be expressed in which cell for example in case of hemoglobin uh, the gene is present in all of the cells but the cell decides that the protein of hemoglobin will be only expressed in rbc's and not in any other cell that's how gene expression is regulated like for example you want to build your own house so you would need uh, money a uh, piece of land raw materials for construction and few workers if either of these materials is not there then you won't be able to make your own house similarly uh, when a gene has to be expressed in the form of protein there are many requirements and processes that have to happen correctly such as proper transcription proper processing of rna export of rna translation etc if all of these processes happen smoothly then only a gene will be expressed uh, i hope till now you are convinced that making of you was never an easy task but requires a lot of processes to happen correctly now briefly i want to discuss a small twist in the central dogma that is what would happen if rna is able to make dna what will you call that process so this process is already established and is known as reverse transcription so let's try to understand this process with the help of an example there are many viruses such as sars cov2 that caused uh, covid hiv that causes aids and many others which have rna as the genetic material so when this virus infects the human cells the rna is released in the cytoplasm gets converted into dna uh, using a protein known as reverse transcriptase once dna is formed it smartly enters uh, into the uh, new clears and intermingles with our dna then central dogma is followed and viral genes are also transcribed along with human genes now this results in the formation of viral rna and viral protein and hence new vi viral particles are formed these particles are then released from the cell and now these can infect other human cells so this is how the reverse transcription happens in action so the process of reverse transcription can be considered as an exception to central dogma now by now we know that genes make proteins but the question is that do all genes code for proteins the answer is no uh, for this let's go back to the definition of gene a gene is a segment of dna that expresses a certain trait and it can make a protein or it can only make an rna so genes code for different kinds of rna that may or may not get translated into proteins such as the mrnas uh, they, they are the messenger rnas that actually code for proteins but the other rnas such as trnas and rrnas do not uh, make proteins trnas as we know act as translators between mrnas and amino acids and proteins ribosomal rnas are specially found in ribosomes and are most abundant uh, out of all the rna types and their major role is in helping with the protein synthesis now all genes do not code for proteins is one of the instances where something different is happening as uh, opposed to the accepted system and you will be surprised that biology is full of such exceptions the more you delve into it the more you can appreciate these exceptions
in the end i would like to suggest some cool reading books for getting to know the biological processes also i would like to uh, mention that all the images that you just saw in the ppt were uh, simplified and adapted from uh, these books that is uh, the molecular biology of cell written by uh, bruce alberts and ncrts and from google and flat icons I hope this lecture would have ignited curiosity in you to learn gene expression and its regulation in more detail. Uh, thank you for paying the attention.